This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. Interest rates may be going up again. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan hinted at that again today. Greenspan did so as President George Bush talked unspecific general budget talk with Republican and Democratic leaders of Congress. Friendly atmosphere, no details. Nothing to erase widespread doubts that President Bush can deliver on knocking back the huge federal deficit and stick to his no new taxes campaign promise. CBS News White House correspondent Leslie Stahl reports. The president left the White House for a jog, 23 minutes of hard running in the middle of the day. But on the central problem at the office, the budget deficit, he hit the ground walking. We, uh, we want to uh, give a very warm uh, welcome to the president. His first meeting with congressional leaders produced a round of pledges of bipartisan accommodation, but little else. Mr. Bush had promised to get cracking on the deficit right away by appointing his budget negotiators on day one. But it's day two, and there isn't even agreement on a format for budget talks. But of course, we haven't gotten to the issues yet. Taxes were not mentioned. We didn't even say revenue enhancement. There were not a great many specific. But on Capitol Hill, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan's tone was more urgent. He's worried about inflation and the deficit. It is crucial that further steps be taken to support, in support of a long-term policy of reducing budget deficits. We've got a you know, problem. I mean, everyone knows that the problem is called a, a budget deficit. And um, that's what the president will be making these very uh, tough decisions over these next a few weeks. On the stump, candidate Bush was the weaver of dreams about new domestic programs, daycare, education, a war on drugs. I am for the people. But just yesterday, the new budget director, Richard Darman, warned the cabinet they can't afford new initiatives. Other Bush aides put out the word that the president is just beginning to understand the magnitude of the deficit problem as if he just arrived in town. It's very difficult uh, to understand how someone who has uh, been involved at the uh, innermost sanctums of government for the last eight years wouldn't understand the deficit. The president says he will outline his budget plans on February 9th in a speech to Congress. After that, the betting is that Mr. Bush and the Democrats will agree to cooperate, not to really cut the deficit, but to postpone the problem a little longer. Leslie Stahl, CBS News, the White House. 35 members of the House of Representatives called today for a vote on proposed 50% pay increases for Congress, federal judges, and other high officials. The pay increases automatically take effect early next month unless Congress specifically votes no. CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer reports from Capitol Hill that such a vote is unlikely. House will be in order. But not for long. Only 24 minutes and 30 seconds today, and here's the problem. A huge pay raise goes into effect for members of Congress, federal judges, the cabinet, and the executive branch, unless both houses of Congress vote against it by February 8th. Don't bet on that happening. One quick question on the pay raise. For the congressional leadership, it is the hottest of the hot potatoes. That's the most pesky problem that, that I have to deal with, is dealing with our own pay. To make sure that congressmen don't have to vote on it, the congressional leadership has decided no business will be allowed in the House until the deadline passes and the pay raise becomes law. Until then, only pro forma sessions will be conducted, and not everyone is pleased. Is our fear of being honest with ourselves why we are cowardly hiding behind this shameful, gutless pay raise process? The answer, of course, is that while all the federal officials will get the money, the congressmen also get the heat. So no one really wants to vote for a pay raise. The vast majority of the people would vote against the pay raise, uh, but it's also relatively clear that a vast majority of my colleagues want the raise. In the meantime, even those against the raise concede it's all but a done deal. Our problem right now in Congress is the raise isn't justified, the timing is awful, and it's being handled in such a poor way. Otherwise, it's great. Otherwise, you know, we'd all like the money. <laughs> Bob Schieffer, CBS News, Capitol Hill. More tension today on Chicago's already tense commodity markets. They are the targets of a long-running federal investigation of charges that as many as 100 brokers and traders have systematically cheated customers out of millions of dollars. Correspondent Richard Schlesinger has the latest on today's developments. 
They are the daredevil gamblers of the financial world. But some commodities traders in Chicago are starting to get nervous. Today, a federal grand jury subpoenaed records of trading firms on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade. It is all part of a widening two-year FBI undercover investigation into double dealing in the trading pits. These are subpoenas that will gather records of traders who may be under investigation. Some traders are expected to be charged with ripping off their clients, underreporting the sale price of contracts, and pocketing the difference. Experts say the kind of crime the FBI is now investigating has been common in the trading pits for years. To really uh, make sure that the system works properly, you'd have to have a policeman in every pit. But the FBI didn't just work in the pits. The undercover agents lived the high life of successful traders, taking apartments in Tony Chicago neighborhoods, blending in with high rollers. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates the Chicago market, says it knew about the FBI investigation and is cooperating, despite charges that the commission is too lax in its supervision. Well, some of those nervous traders are now starting to sell out. So far, about 30 seats on the Mercantile Exchange and the Board of Trade have been sold, and the price for a seat is headed down. Dan? Thanks, Richard. New reports today that Health and Human Services Secretary-designate Dr. Lewis Sullivan disagrees with the Bush-Quayle abortion policy. This comes just one day after President Bush and Vice President Quayle urged the Supreme Court to reverse its 1973 ruling legalizing abortion. Privately, Dr. Sullivan reportedly has told members of Congress he does not want the court's landmark ruling ensuring women's choice reversed. On Capitol Hill, Republican Senator Gordon Humphrey of New Hampshire said flat out today that Republican fear of offending black voters is the main reason there won't be a major drive to have the Sullivan nomination withdrawn. If, if it were not a situation in which Dr. Sullivan is the only black nominee for a high position, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, we would be in, it would be in order to ask President Bush to uh, uh, nominate someone else. I don't think he would, but it might be in order to ask him. But because Dr. Sullivan is the only black nominee to a high office, uh, it just ha would have an untoward appearance. Sullivan himself remains unavailable for comment, but tonight White House officials insisted Sullivan told them he was misquoted and does support the Bush-Quayle abortion policy. This was the second time in recent weeks that reports surfaced suggesting that Dr. Sullivan supports a woman's right to choose to have an abortion. Saturday marks the third anniversary of the Challenger explosion. It took until September this year to get U.S. space shuttles flying again. And now there's a new threat, one that could ground the shuttle fleet and keep all U.S. rockets, civilian and military, from leaving the launch pad. CBS News Defense Department correspondent David Martin tonight investigates a critical shortage of a key rocket fuel ingredient. It looks like an ordinary construction project lost in the middle of nowhere. But what will be produced here in southwest Utah is the key ingredient of rocket fuel. As far as NASA and the Department of Defense are concerned, nothing could be more important than this plant. It has to be finished in record time or else. We have a very much of a horse race. If we, uh, we make July, we're in relatively good shape. If we slip month after month, then we progressively get into worse shape. The horse race started last May when a thunderous series of explosions destroyed this chemical plant operated by Pepcon, one of only two suppliers of ammonium perchlorate, the substance which makes rocket fuel burn. Ammonium perchlorate is used by everything from the space shuttle to the MX missile to ejection seats, some 80 systems in all. Without the ammonium perchlorate, we can't fly. Not only can we not fly the shuttle, we can't fly any rockets at all. It would have to be classified as a crisis, particularly with the shuttle coming back on stream and the amount of ammonium perchlorate that's used in each launch. Shortages of ammonium perchlorate already have forced a slowdown in production of Titan boosters, which the Air Force uses to launch satellites into space. Production of standard missiles, the Navy's frontline defense against enemy aircraft, has been suspended. Right now, this plant, run by Kerr McGee, is the sole source of ammonium perchlorate. But even operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it cannot begin to meet the demand, a fact which seemed to catch the government by surprise. The level we were at, the 
people were not fully aware of where ammonium perchlorate came from. Shortages will continue to get worse until this second ammonium perchlorate plant comes online. Work is going ahead in the dead of winter, even though it adds to the cost. A $60 million bill that ultimately will be footed by the taxpayer. If, and it's a big if, this plant can start turning out ammonium perchlorate by May, the crisis in rocket fuel will be averted. But that will not change the fact that both NASA and the Department of Defense were completely unprepared for a disruption in the supply of a product vital to national security. David Martin, CBS News, Cedar City, Utah.